So in today's interview, we speak with Susan Manowich once again, and she's the president of the New Energy Movement as well as a contactee. If you haven't watched her first piece where she talks about um, her contactee experience and everything that led up to her contactee research, you may want to do that one before watching this just because this kind of builds on that story a little bit more deeply. In this interview, we talked a lot about her experience with new energy technologies and what's emerging in that space. Um, her being directly involved in this industry for quite some time and being the president of the new energy movement, you know, she has access to people that are vetting these technologies, that are seeing what's real firsthand, and some of the, you know, sort of the challenges that come with not only doing this work, but also bringing it into a world that is still not quite ready, if you want to call it that, for these technologies. And we're going to get into that a lot in this interview. And the reason why we wanted to do this is we wanted to sort of demystify this space. We've been following and working with inventors for about four years when it comes with the new energy space. And for, you know, to be honest, for lack of a better way of explaining it, we haven't really been able to come out and say, hey, here's exactly what's going on in this space because there's a lot of tricky layers and nuances. So the purpose of doing this interview is to kind of demystify it a little bit, look at what is real and look at what is actually happening versus some of the stuff that's sort of presented on the internet of, oh my God, this is amazing, here it is, it's like totally legit, it's totally real, because um, that is there. But we sometimes forget to look at the deeper aspect of this entire thing. And that's what this interview is going to do. So enjoy it, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff we talked about after the interview uh, once again, as per usual. So yesterday we talked a lot about um, you know, your experience as a contactee and your background a little bit. We touched a little bit on your background in new energy and mm -hmm. uh, hidden energy and how all that stuff mm -hmm. is sort of emerging. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we dive deeper into that subject and sort of if, if it relates how does you know your journey of some of the you know contactee experience lead into your interest in new energy? Ah, uh, that's a really good question because um, I was wondering that myself. Um, <laughs> meaning on a surface level, because at, at a deep level, I under I feel like I understand what that connection is. Um, meaning, like, let me give you a, a for example. Uh, a very close colleague of mine um, is an engineer in Europe. And we had connected um, about a year and a half ago because of similar interests that we had in, um, let's just say, consciousness evolution. And that's how we met. So he was actually trying to understand um, from a technological standpoint how things like anti-gravity would work um, and you know certain other, let's call it ether-based devices, you know, how, how that would work. So he actually started asking me about my contact. In, you know, sometimes people will ask you in great detail. Uh, sometimes the, the type of questions that they ask are more, um, you know, what, what I'll call basic. And, and sometimes people will really drop in and really try to understand what the nature of these experiences are. And he, he did that and he asked me one really big question. He said, well, what do you think this is for? Why, why would they have this type of, you know, relationship with you? What is this for? And I simply said, well, it's for our evolution. And he said, so what you're saying, this is moral technology. And, you know, talking about the ship and the energetic and, you know, anti-gravity and again, thinking of like ether-based devices. And it just struck me at that moment. I said, oh my God, that is it. It's morally based. Mm -hmm. And that is what has been something of, um, I'll call my underpinning <laughs> of, of how I approach a huge variety of, of things in my life, how I've approached consulting when I was doing, you know, work in the business world before, um, you know, doing what I'm doing now. Um, that the, this deep, what I call moral integral um, component is something that is an enormous part of I believe bringing forth these new energy technologies, both in the creation of them, but also in the ecosystem that they need to be held in. And you know, we can talk in greater detail about what's gone on in the field of new energy technology. But this is something that, like, as a being, I can't escape or get away from, and and say that it's not a part of the the core, you know, aspect of who and what I am. And you know, we could debate well what is moral and what isn't. But you know, to me, um, what 
what I've experienced with the beings and also just, I guess, my own consciousness is that um, that we are genuinely here, you know, maybe not all of us or that we're aware, to work for humanity and the earth and that that the ego is not the driving force in this, 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 this thing, that it's truly about um, responding to the needs of the earth, responding to the needs of humanity, and responding to the needs of the cosmos because earth is connected to the cosmos. We, you know, kind of act and pretend that it's not or we have this fanciful idea of what it may be, but, you know, there's something deeper at this core um, that is asking us to, to show up in a more um, integral way in a way that is in this greater alignment. It doesn't mean we can't have our own individuality and have fun and, you know, do all of these, these other things. Um, but it, 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 there's something, it, there, there's serious business at hand that's needing to be, to be balanced out, it, it appears. So um, when I got into the field of new energy technology more and more and more, I was kind of shocked and dismayed and even slightly horrified at how I saw money move and how I saw things roll and go. And it seemed like almost an impossible endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to lie. It was like, wait a minute, how is the, these, how is it that these experiences that I've had and something that I hold so, so deep and sacred to, to, to me um, is now potentially going to be used in a field that is not, um, it was like the Wild West. That's what I've called it a couple of times and I've heard other people say that. Um, so how do these two reconcile? Because it felt like the worlds were really, really, really polar opposite. Mm -hmm. And I realized that um, it's one of the major components that's needed in this arena and in this field. And even my background in um, leadership consulting, emotional intelligence work, um, uh, I, I used to also do some um, um, quantum healing hypnosis with people. Like all of my skills and abilities and even a master's degree in organizational development, like all of these skills and abilities were needed in this arena now in order to help to move things along um, in a cleaner way. Yeah. So how long have you been in the field of, of new energy? Well, um, when I was in my um, early 20s, um, I was spending time, um, you know, throughout my 20s and um, part of my 30s with um, astrophysicists and physicists always quietly discussing and talking. Um, it's not like we had formal, well, we did have formal meetings, but they weren't like, like these big meetings that, you know, were on TV or you advertise them. It was just private meetings. So we would always discuss um, the physics and we would discuss the consciousness and we would discuss, you know, what's moving and happening in this field. And more formally, um, I began to work in this arena in 2012. So I would say I've been uh, heavily and actively involved since 2012, but on the back end, um, working with what I would say are some of my mentors and friends since, um, you know, the early 90s. Nice. And so what position do you hold in the new energy movement? So I was asked to be uh, president of the organization by Joel Garbin. Uh, Joel is a, a really nice human being and very knowledgeable and has done a lot of work previously. Uh, the organization was started by Dr. Brian O'Leary. Uh, so I think it was January of 2017, they asked me if I would actually take over the whole thing. Um, and, you know, not just be, be president, but really, you know, take over the whole thing. So um, that is something that I, I did uh, in 2017. And it took me a little while to kind of get, uh, I would call, up and moving. My dad was sick at the time um, of cancer and he had passed away. So uh, by, let's say, um, late spring of 2017, I got in fast and hard. Uh, just the nature of the universe was asking me to do that. And also, you know, it was something that it, I felt inside that, you know, needed to be done. So <clears throat> what I would say is this, this is one of the, the comments that I want to make. Um, there's an outside perception of that, well, we just do X, Y, Z. We just find an invention and we find inventors and then we have these different devices and then we find the right investors and then it all works. <laughs> it's not the case. And I definitely will go into a little bit more of that. Um, it has, if you're going to do this well and you're going to do this right, 
you need to really understand the dynamics that are at play. And I feel like I have been asked to really understand the deep dynamics that are at play because it matters that much to do so. And only when you are spending time with different inventors, you know, all around the world, um, and seeing and meeting them and, and hearing their stories and looking more deeply into, well, how come this hasn't come out? Mm -hmm. um, and understanding the funding aspect about the, the money piece and, and how that moves and also just looking at you know, the people that they've had working with them for a number of years and sometimes maybe the sabotage that's gone on or sometimes the incredible um, deep support that they've been given. And, and you know, you, you look at all of these factors and they're all important variables to really, you know, get in there to know the story. And, you know, not every inventor is the same and not every device is the same and not every investor is the same. So. Um, when you when you understand things at a deeper level, you start to get the answer as to well why this hasn't come out yet, yep. and what is really the to do. So, uh, I, I've you know not intentionally updated our website. I, have, I haven't done things. It's like I've been. I feel like for myself and for you know some of the the people that I work with that, you know, we're asked to go deep to educate ourselves about why, because it matters that much. And I do have some answers now uh, that I didn't have previously as to why I think um, these things haven't really you know, popped yet and what's, what's needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll get into that 100% mm -hmm. in terms of what's going on with the consciousness there of why these things are, are, are playing out. Yeah. Um, I, I almost want to backtrack for a second and say, okay, so you've been in this space for a while. Yep. Uh, you now hold the position of president in the new energy movement. Right. I think that can say that you've seen some things, right? Yep. Um, so what I'd what I'd like to to sort of go through here is some of the some of what happens with the general public as they witness the small details of what's going on in this movement because they're not getting the full story, the full breadth, right? Right. Right. There's a lot of disbelief. Right. Are these technologies real? Mm -hmm. Is it all just a, a scam? Uh, are all these people just charlatans that are doing this stuff? How, you know, how come it hasn't come out? We'll, we'll get into that right. one specifically. But right. what would you say if someone said, you know, are these technologies real? I would say yes, they are. Yes. yes. And when that is said, it, it, uh, would you say that these technologies are available, like in the sense of they're developed, they've proven to work, and they could be implemented? Um, regardless of the consciousness end, but they could be implemented in a practical manner. Yes. Yes. So then, you know, when it comes to how some of these technologies work, let's not go into the specifics for a second because that's more of the, the scientific -y background, but if we get into like, you know, what are we seeing as part of these? Are, are they pulling energy from the ether? Are they using magnets? Are they like, how do some of these technologies work? Sure. I mean, all of the above. Um, some are more plasma based. Um, some are working more with the ether than others. Uh, so, and we talk about this in the Hidden Energy book as well. Um, some are solid state, some are magnetic, some are cold fusion. Uh, so it's, it's a variety. Mm -hmm. it, there's uh, some cavitation technology. So there's a variety of different ways that energy can be utilized. Yeah. And that's kind of cool and interesting when you think about that, mm -hmm. right? It's like, well, there's not just one way that we're going to go about this, even though you know we pro primarily work <laughs> right now with with you know a couple of ways that we're getting our energy. But you know, we we realize from what we've seen is that there's multiple ways to do this, and it seems like the more you look, the more you're actually going to find. Uh, so, and, and those are some of the devices that we've seen. I, I will say this, you know, there's conversations about what I would call ether-based energy that there's still so a lot of unknowns with it, that right. it could be potentially dangerous and it could be, uh, you know, it could create some effects that maybe we, we don't really want or know about, you mm -hmm. know, so there's, there's more research that's needed. And, you know, this is one of the reasons that this arena deserves to be well run and well funded because there are some unknowns and instead of us being so and who is the us i'm just saying the big collective us right like instead of us m making an automatic assumption that it's going to do something highly destructive um, well, we don't know, so right. let's do some additional research to understand, you know, what is actually happening and going on. But it does seem, you know, what I call like the more ether-based technologies are um, less well understood than, let's say, solid state. 
you know, type of device. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, what I've seen more often than not is the solid state type of device that is actually producing over Unity. Right. Um, just a ballpark figure, it doesn't have to be accurate, but how many devices would you say that you know are, are working and existing and could be very well used in a practical societal manner? Okay. Um, that I have seen personally or that I know of? Um, let's go with seen personally and, okay. and you know that there's been vetting there to yep. say that this works. Yeah. Uh, I would say, I want to be accurate. Between five and six. Between five and six. Yeah. And, and that is in, I just want to say this, that's in the last year and a half. There has seemed to be some type of rise mm -hmm. recently with the production of Over Unity where in, in years prior, um, vetters were not really getting these consistent type of results. Mm -hmm. And now that seems to be shifting a bit. And you know, that's just my own personal sphere of, of what I've been working in and what I've been seeing. Um, but my, my colleagues can actually um, verify that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were to add to that, ones that you're on pretty good, like mm -hmm. you know, without, you, you're not making a claim of this is a fact, but you're on pretty right. good standing that you would think that there's other legit devices out, devices out there. What number would you say w would be of that? Okay, well, if I look at what's, I mean, it's a, it's a hypothetical and yes. it's a guess, um, but if I look at, you know, in my little, my little world, um, which is, you know, it's little in its own way, um, if, if I've seen what I've seen for the number that I just gave you, if I was to extrapolate that out, you know, with others, I mean, there probably has to be a, at least double that, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, if we want to extrapolate more, then, then maybe even more than that, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe 15. Um, I don't want to overestimate because I think that's silly because, yeah. um, because I'm, and again, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a vetter, but I work with people that are really good at what they do. Um, you know, sometimes people don't necessarily get what they think they have. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one of the reasons that developing good vetting protocols, not as a way to regulate, you know, what these inventors and, and creators are doing, but as a way to help. Yeah. To say, well, hey, hold on, before you, you know, make these claims, you know, maybe we can help you out to show you some of the different, you know, ways that you can actually vet these technologies yourself mm -hmm. in a cheap and easy way um, to see what you really have. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. Um, so th there's a couple of types of suppression here mm -hmm. when it comes to these technologies. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about one that's not talked about as much in a moment, but okay. let's begin with some of the ones that people generally talk about and believe are the only form of suppression, which okay. is, um, you know, whether it be the secret patent law offices sort of uh, utilizing various individuals to, you know, buy up or grasp these technologies yeah. and shelve them, yeah. um, or just other forms of suppression that may just be hiding of information, the scientific community kind of, you know, saying this is not true, yeah. you know, what have you seen in that and what, what could you touch on as a direct uh, experiencer? Okay, I've heard stories. So yeah. it's not like I have gone through the process of working with an inventor, them uh, trying to create a patent and then going through the patent office and then having XYZ happened with it. So, mm -hmm. so I would say that I have not had a direct experience in that way. So when I'm now choosing to discuss this, it's from what I've heard inventors talk about with their stories. And what does seem to be kind of commonplace at this point is if you really want to get your technology out, you, you don't go through the patent office to do that. Mm -hmm. And that does seem to be more commonplace in regards to it. You know, I, I, try, to, I try to be open-minded in the sense and, and not have an attachment to well, this is definitely going to happen and that's definitely going to happen because I think there's circumstances in each variable in each situation that, you know, changes the, the direction and the course of things. So, um, you know, so I, I don't try to have too big of an attachment right now to what the patent office will definitely do because I don't work there. I haven't researched it enough to know exactly, you know, what um, what they're doing and what they're not doing. But from what this, from the stories that I've heard is most inventors that legit have something will not typically go through that avenue. It does seem like uh, it's one that they do not have a lot of faith and trust in. But there are some 
that were able to get some successful patents in the past on certain parts of their technology, maybe not the whole thing, um, because they didn't necessarily, and, and most typically don't want to reveal you know, all the secret sauce stuff in there. Um, and that's probably a wise thing to do. So um, you know, they, they're, they're pieces and parts that they have gotten patented previously. Um, but I, I'm going to say, I feel like I don't know of anyone right now that is going through that process. I mean, there may be one or two, but I'm not actively involved in that. Hopefully that answers your question, but that's an honest answer. Yep. Um, you know, we've, we've all heard the stories, and it's probably true. Um, I just haven't had that experience in, in my day-to-day -day workings with inventors where they're, you know, literally trying to work with the patent office right now. Yep. Okay, and so when when we we get into more deeply, sometimes people begin to say, okay, well, you know, we recognize there's some of that trickery going on, but yeah, then, yeah. you know, at the same time, it's like, but like, can't people just like blast this out into the society and just you know put it on put it in front of everybody and say, hey, it's real, and then all yeah. of a sudden we would implement it. You know, mm. this gets into a different type of suppression that exists where we can start talking about consciousness. Yeah. So yeah. let's get into to that a little bit and, and how consciousness um, of our current world relates to why these technologies aren't quite getting out now. Because <laughs> that, that's, again, this is, this is what's been my last year and a half of yeah. this work is understanding what is in the way. Yep. What's going on and what's in the way? I mean, the variables are, are long and <laughs> long and thick at times. Um, your to your point about well, what if we were just to put it on the internet? Now, I just had a conversation last week with someone whom I trust deeply and has been working on these type of technologies for a very, very long time. And he is well aware right now of a technology that is working and the inventor has done that. And as the inventor has put the information online, it is now getting um, trolls, you know, are on there mm -hmm. doing their thing, trying to discredit it. And so now it's, it's shifting the 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 it's shifting the conversation right and so people that were believing that this is going to work and we're going to go you know out and recreate it a certain way obviously now have um, some doubt some some don't on the discussion board and i haven't seen the discussion board um but but some do so you know it, it, it's not as i think the reality is is this isn't as simple as let's just put it out on the internet yeah. and it's you know, then we have this fantasy that everyone's going to figure it out and, you know, we're all going to be merry and happy and we're all going to be, you know, powering our, our homes and cars and, and, and whatnot in our communities with these technologies. It's, it doesn't seem to be the, the easiest answer at this point. It, it seems to be um, an easy option to offer, but it doesn't seem to be, you know, the easiest way to go about it because the, you know, the, the, the credibility also needs to be established um, with the inventor, with the community that's there. I mean, there needs to be some type of an established um, credibility, if you ask me, that that is is that this is coming from, and it probably has to be a big of enough population in terms of the quality of the type of people that are wanting to um, create this, because it's not like, you know. I think the average person can literally just go and, and do X, Y, Z. I mean, you have to have a passion, you have to have an interest, and you have to have the time and capacity to be able to work on these things and also be able to buy some of the equipment. So, you know, like there, there's there's factors that are at play here. Um, so that would be an, my answer to your question on that, that the consciousness absolutely needs to shift in order for people to even understand the, the value of what they may be getting and to have the discernment because there are other whew, there are other devices that are online um, that are there for um, to throw you off track um, and they don't work and they will bring you down a rabbit hole um, and even though people have said that this device works and let me show you it when it's actually gone and gotten vetted and yes i do know about this firsthand it doesn't work it doesn't mm -hmm. hold to the mustard and yet you have you know a very 
significant number of people that are actually trying to cr replicate these technologies. So you also have to have the discernment to know what's false, what's real, and to what degree, mm -hmm. right? And so that takes a lot of time to figure out what's legit and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, so not all of what's on YouTube for these videos showing, you know, over unity is actually performing at over unity. Mm -hmm. um, what I see is probably one of the biggest detriments to getting these technologies out is the infrastructure and what I'm calling now the, the ecosystem that all of this is held in. Uh, what I've seen really actively, and not just in the last year and a half, but since 2012, is the, the cart is before the horse on mm -hmm. this development where um, you've got the money that comes in from the investor and then you've got the technology from the inventor and what stage is the technology typically at. Um, most investors operate on a timeline. They operate on getting an ROI on their you know, investment, right? And so um, typically the inventors do not want to be held to a specific timeline. And there does seem to be something about the way time, space, and the universe works that doesn't allow that to take place either. I mean, I, I've seen this up close um, firsthand on several occasions and you know, hear the stories from the inventors that are like, I can't do what this person wants me to do. This is not the way that this is all dropping in. So um, you, you've got those components at play. It's almost like you're trying to bring in a device that is of a higher vibrational energy into a structure that cannot support it. So what, do you, what needs to change? You need to change the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You need to change the structure. And so that's what myself and, and several really bright people that I work with this is the conclusion that we've come to at this point. The cart is constantly leading before the horse. And in this change of this transition that we are on the planet, we are asked, we are being asked, if, 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 if this is, you know, if someone's asking me, what do you really think? Here's what I really think. We are being asked to stop being so focused on the end goal, on this material end goal, and to actually have this faith and trust and collaboration with a, a um, not a 51, you know, 49 split way uh, or in a weird hierarchical control way. We are actually asked inside to shift and transition who we are to collaborate in a very unique and different way, mm -hmm. in a way that is more in alignment with the harmony of the earth and the harmony of the universe. We're being asked to do that. Yeah. And it seems to me that these are how these devices will be able to come out. You know, so it's, it's not just we're in a technological revolution. Mm -hmm. We're in a consciousness revolution, and the technology is the output, uh, one of, excuse me, it's not the output, it's one of the outputs of it. I mean, this is something that, that at some point can be planetary-wide, but it does seem that there's, you know, a small committed group of individuals that are actively working on this, and they feel like it's, it's their sole mission to do yep. it. But it hasn't been done in a way that's honorable to their soul. For sure. Yeah. And what's, what's amazing about this and, and, you know, why I was so excited to, to have this interview is, is um, you know, essentially what you're saying is the collective consciousness of humanity is the number one thing suppressing this technology in the sense that, you know, we and how we live, how we be, how we go about seeing each other, mm -hmm. how we interact mm -hmm. with our infrastructures, mm -hmm. comes down to we need to change ourselves yes. in order for this technology to yes. come out. And maybe yes. suppression is a tough word, but yeah. it's almost as if like we need to take responsibility for ourselves here. Right. This isn't about government. It's not about waiting for someone else right. to do it. This is about we need to change. We need to, as the people come together, right. work together, shift right. our ways of being. Mm -hmm. and work on bringing this thing out and only when that because you talked about how this is a moral technology you've also said the word sacred technology a number of times it is and i assume by that you mean you know and this is i'd love to have you comment on this yeah. but by that you mean like when you're saying this is a moral technology this is a sacred technology what does that mean to you as it relates to this whole this whole thing mm. because there's an aliveness to it 
it's if if we stop looking at objects that we relate to or rather that we utilize as dead I mean if you go back and look at the the research with um, what I was quoting about the, the free study you know what is the one major thing that came up that contactees were being taught and learning about is that the universe is a living system that everything is alive and everything is connected mm -hmm. so these technologies are very much alive. I mean, you know, here we are tapping into something that in some way is, is interacting with us, right? And interacting with the ether. Therefore, it's, it's a relationship. And that's not how we look at technology today, right? We look at it, we get into a car and it's a car, it's a hard, dense <laughs> object. And, 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 you know, we're, even our, our phones, even though there's an intimacy with our phones, you know, it's, it's <laughs> like this object. And sometimes if you don't like it, you're like, ah, I just want to throw my phone, you know, yeah. over here. Um, but, but this, we're being asked to have a different relationship with our, yeah. our what we are creating. Yeah. Um, I mean, Rudolf Steiner was an incredible visionary about knowing what is actually possible for us that, that, um, that, how we, technology is an amplification of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. He didn't say it exactly like that, but that was my interpretation. And so what are we amplifying? Yeah. Are we amplifying dead, something that's dead? Are we going to amplify something that's alive? And I think that's why, you know, when you look at some of these inventors, they have not had an easy road. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, well, I mean, even myself, you know, to a degree, this, this stuff has not been easy. This is not an easy road. Like you choose to do this or this is your mission. Um, you stick with it because you know it really matters deeply. And you know that um, there's, a, there's a love that these inventors have for what they're doing because it's, you know, again, it's part of their sole mission, but it's because this, there's an aliveness here. This isn't, you know, most of these inventors that get into it, um, it's, like I said, it's a calling that they have, and it's because there's a relationship they have with this, what they're creating, because there's an interaction that they're having with the ether, right? I mean, you can see this aliveness, and, um, you know, th this to me is, it's, it's one of the most, um, interesting aspects of why people don't just like quit their job and then you know go or, or quit working um, to create this stuff and then you know work to, for some place down the street mm -hmm. because once you tap into that aliveness you don't want to release that yeah. you don't want to stop you don't want to go back to um, a world that that doesn't feel alive again yeah mm -hmm. that's interesting and well said and it and it, it it suggests that you know, when you find that thing you're passionate about or something that, you know, you could say is, is part of your sole purpose, yeah. right? Um, and pe people have a lot of different words for how to describe that feeling right. and that process, but um, it, it, it fuels you and it keeps you going and it pushes you through some of the challenge. And yeah. it, it could be said, and it, if you look at it, and maybe this is generalizing, but I mean, it appears to be from people I talk to, but from what looks out there yeah. is, you know, not a lot of us are doing that right as a collective a lot of us are kind of doing mm -hmm. things we don't ideally want to be doing right. and we're not sure what to do so right. one of the questions I have as it relates to this technology and as we just talked about how we, we got to change the way not just in the energy space but right. but in in general on the planet we got to change right. the way we interact with our physical world as you were saying and the way right. we interact with with how we do these things what can people who are watching this interview like what can they do where do they start with making that a little bit real and practical in their own lives. Mm. I'd ask, who, who are you really working for? And who do you want to work for? And I mean, I look at myself and the transition point that I had where, you know, I, I couldn't work for someone else. The love for humanity that I have, even though, you know, at times I'm not too pleased <laughs> with how we do things. But I, I love my family. I love my child. I love my, um, I love my trees, like that are not mine, but I look at them and you know, I, I, I love, I love this planet. I love the energy of this planet and the diversity of this planet. And I look at that and say, well, what do I love? What's worth my time and energy? And when I think one makes that shift inside that 
I'm going to work for something that matters more, which is not the self, like not the ego, but it's it's for humanity and the planet. It's almost like, you know, things begin to reorganize. And I think, you know, I mean, even people watching this, right, it's like, well, hey, how do I get, I mean, because this has been the big thing. Because this, this listen, our arena of consciousness is not well funded. It's not like you can mm -hmm. go down to, you know, your local your local town and be like, yeah, I just want a job in consciousness. And yeah. I want a job in you know new energy technology. Yeah. I mean, there's um, there's a lot of you know these really great like young people that uh, that I work with and trying to find you know little spaces and places like things that that they can get into. When I say little, like in the sense of it doesn't have to be a huge paying job, but you know let's find a way that that they can start actually getting compensated so they don't have to work in solar. And not that I'm dissing solar, but the point is is they want to be creating this. They want to be doing you know, these type of different technologies. Yeah. So, you know, we're trying to piece things together to try to get some funding in play and try to, you know, get them um, uh, moving where they should be, which feels like their sole purpose, as opposed to, again, working in something that they don't really believe in. So, you know, what can people do? Like I, I, I said before, I think m my generation's job, like, you know, I, I come in with certain skills and abilities in, in certain connections because of, academic and corporate work that I've done and I think it's my job to to help change the minds of my peers um, to say hey you know there's there's another generation that's coming behind us that we have to do a better job preparing for so you know you want to put funds in this way I think that maybe you should divert them in this way um, so I think each each generation has a bit of a different responsibility but I think on a day-to-day, a, a -day, like you know, point self standpoint, it is it is that change from within. I mean, there's stuff that I've accepted in my life that was so less than who and what I really am. And until you actually get maybe fed up enough, and until you actually believe in yourself enough, um, then you kind of keep accepting things that are not. Um, truly in your path, right? Not mm -hmm. truly in, the, in that higher sense. So, you know, I would ask people, what are you accepting that you shouldn't be right now? And what is it that you can actually create and potentially, um, um, you know, provide some type of a base for yourself? Um, because there are creative ways to, to make income. Because I think the income thing, I mean, I think we have to be really blatantly honest about it. You know, you can only survive so long on on you know your goodwill to to help out the planet mm -hmm. like you know there's there's times that the money factor comes into play and if it's not if you're not getting something that you can actually take care of yourself and pay your bills and and you know n nourish yourself appropriately then then it you begin to to you know not do so well mm -hmm. um, so you know it's like what changes can be made that are appropriate to make without you completely losing things in your life, yeah. right? And it's a, you know, I think we talked about this earlier, it, there's a bit of a hero's journey that's mm -hmm. at play here. Um, you know, there's folks that I know that have, I'll call, gotten into the new energy arena recently, and it's almost like they expect that they're going to have a paying job. It's like, you know, that doesn't, that's not the way it works. This has been a severely underfunded arena, and there's, there's a lot of, um, blood, sweat, tears, and, and, you know, super hard work that needs to come into play to make these things happen. So um, I think also understanding that, that there's groundwork that is constantly needing to be done here um, mm -hmm. and being okay to do that because to me the hero's journey is, hey, not everybody is, is on board with this and will you be one of the first people that um, helps to, you know, maybe start a foundation or helps to, you know, divert funds to where they need to be or maybe, you know, helps a, a local community that, that's in, you know, dire need. So, you know, there's, I believe, too, that there's a lot of firsts that are being asked for right now and the pathway is not necessarily, you know, cut clear. Um, but, you know, t to me, like I said, I think it's my generation's job is to, you know, do as much as we can do to cut that pathway open for people to be able to come into more easily. Nice. It's nice. a well long said. answer, but was there's a lot there. Beautiful. Well said. All right. um, so uh, we, I feel like we covered the sort of the, some of the consciousness part of here of what's going okay. on within this new energy stuff. And um, one of the questions that it, it, it sort of relates because if we're, if we're going through this shift, which I'd love to have a, a deeper conversation about later, um, and 
these inventors are coming up with these ideas, these stuff, and we also talked about some of the contactee experience, and, and I feel like there's a bit of an overlap there here. There is, yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes we can say, hey, the inventors are, 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 you know, they're expanding upon more fringy ideas that have been out there, and, and perhaps that's what it is, and some inventors almost appear to get this stuff from somewhere else, or, yeah. or know that they got right. it from a contact experience. Right, right, right. Um, how much does that relate and, and at what percentage would you say of inventors? Just again, ballpark figure, yeah. it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, well this, is, this was really interesting because when, when I was, so I'm still working on, we're wrapping up the Hidden Energy book with my co-author, Jean Manning. I just wanna take a moment to say about her. She has 30 years of experience working in this arena. You know, not that many women <laughs> have been in this. There's just a, you know, literally like a handful. And I think I, I know most of them. And yeah. there may be some that I don't know, but um, I, I think I know most of them. And <clears throat> her knowledge and her background and her steadfastness in trying to um, report the stories of these inventors um, in their lives has been long and, and wide and there's a deep level of respect that that is there um, for her in regards to this work because that longevity you know again we live in a day and age with YouTube and and <laughs> the internet and there's so much information that gets said and it's like but where's the truth and when you have a colleague who has a longevity from a consistency standpoint before what I call the weird infiltration comes into play you start to get a realer story you start to get you know like oh we don't have just 10 missing pieces of information you know here like we, we actually have like you know 9 out of 10 of the pieces that we need to, to really understand what, what's going on so that's, that's one small piece um, but when I was working on the book with with Jean um, I didn't understand how, you know, because life throws you these different things, I didn't understand how this other research I was doing would really come into play. Um, so the research that I just finished was about um, the, the scientific and telepathic downloads that contactees would get, as, as we talked about previously. And I didn't have an attachment to one versus the other. I kind of had an idea that some of these inventors may have been, let's say, inspired in non-traditional ways. Mm -hmm. And yes, they in fact were. But what I was finding as I was going through the research, which took a good eight months to really go through thoroughly, and as I'm going out, visiting all these inventors, and writing the Hidden Energy book with Jean, um, that there was in fact quite an overlap. And, and let me be specific though, not every inventor is a contactee. However, um, quite a few, if not all of the inventors, have had what I would call non-traditional ways of knowing by getting downloads, um, information in dreams. Some do recall past life experiences where they've come back to the planet to finish the job this time that they didn't finish last time. Um, some have gotten it through um, gurus and teachers, and one in particular, his name is Guy Obolinsky, he passed away uh, last year, and uh, Yogananda was, was his teacher, mm -hmm. and he talked very deeply and greatly about how Yogananda has inspired him, um, not just about the creation of the device, but about how to navigate his own emotions and his own consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. to help him through this life and that inspiration um, that has taken place and in, in, uh, that took place in his life. So, I mean, what we have found in even um, you know, some of the academic folks have had contact, you know, they don't talk about it so much because they have to be careful of their academic, cre you know, credibility. But I would say the vast majority of the inventors have had what I would call some form of divine inspiration. Uh, and, you know, even, even with Tawari, um, which I know you have a fam familiarity with, you know, he, he, he was inspired from Vedic math yep. and, and, and that relationship. So uh, in, in some of what I would say the more talented um, inventors, scientists, uh, physicists, um, even medical doctors that, that I've worked with, 
will talk about their relationship to spirit. Absolutely. And that it is, it is a relationship, and it's not a blip. It's not like they just had a dream, you know, when they were 20, and then, you know, they're developing this device, and then that's it. <laughs> this is an ongoing relationship. It's, a, it's, it's ongoing. So I would say definitely the vast majority of people um, have had these experiences. And we talk about it a little bit in the book, but, you know, we have to be careful because there's credibility that they need to maintain as well. And, you know, it's, it's usually was the kiss of, and I won't say the, the five letter word, I think it's five letters, yes. <laughs> um, that, that, you know, you don't, you don't talk about the UFO ET thing, right? Yeah. Or you don't talk about spirit because it weakens you. Yes. And in the reality, what do we see from a true, a true, you know, day-to-day -day life standpoint that this is, this is at the core. Absolutely. And this is the, the, I guess, if we really want to, not to go back to it, but if we want to talk about the third suppression that sort of exists, it's, it's from that sort of elite cabal who is trying to suppress the consciousness part. Absolutely. Because they know how yes. deep that is. And, yes. you know, we've always talked about, like, you look at these incredible thinkers, so you think of, say, Einstein or Tesla, for example, yeah. just because they're popular names. And right. um, there's many others on this list, but they always referred to a deeper consciousness, yeah. a deeper state of presence, mm -hmm. connecting to something deeper. Mm -hmm. And then you have the more clinical thinkers who steal the credit for other people's inventions. <laughs> who, yeah. you know, we can get yeah. into Edison all day long yeah, on that, yeah, right? Yeah, who, yeah who, it's, it still happens in today. But absolutely, yes, right? Yes. The clinical, yeah. more scientific look at everything where they're making, mm -hmm. you know, this, this UFO e spirit stuff, the kiss of death, because, yeah. you know, they don't want people to know that this stuff does come from having a deeper connection with self. Right. Right. And that's a fascinating link. Right. Exactly. And as, as I was saying previously, it's like, why was I so challenging at seven years old that I needed to be taken out of school and asked about my contact? Mm -hmm. What? You know, like, what was the big threat? Yes. Because if someone did that, there had to be a reason for it. And I firmly, firmly believe that it is about the suppression of consciousness. 100%. And it's why it's become, I don't want to say popular to criticize these things, but um, it, it's a joke because it's actually the answer. upside down. For sure. And I think as well, I, I, I want to say this too, the irony is as these groups are suppressing this information, they're stealing it at the same time mm. because they can't create. You right. know, they are the, whomever the, they are, the they's are, and I'm mm -hmm. sorry if you're listening to this, but th they cannot create, they know how to steal. Operation and they know Paperclip. To, yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and so they're taking that originality. They're actually taking, I don't want to say they're taking the divinity, they're taking the information, they can never take the divinity, mm -hmm. but they're taking the information that's yep. gleaned from these experiences and from this knowledge and from this information that's coming from these beautiful sources you know, and I say it's like kind of like the ultimate form of jealousy because they 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 feel as if they cannot, you know, develop it on their own or, or come to this state of awareness. And you know, likely it's not that they can't, but it's that they've chosen not to. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I said this saying, and I'll say it again: there's no shortcut to the divine. But they're still trying to steal that information. So as the suppression is happening, they're snatching it at the same time, and mm -hmm. they're coming out with their own narratives, their own versions, their own idea of, of you know, how, uh, what new energy is, <laughs> and how it's gonna, you know, save the planet, but, you know, let, let's look who's gonna, you know, benefit off of this, mm -hmm. and boom, you know, here we go, the same cycle again. Mm -hmm. I completely agree 100%. And I'll also say, I think it's one of the reasons, you know, we look at where, all this, where did all this, you know, money go missing, right? If you've seen Catherine Austin Fitz and her report about, you know, just an insane amount of money that's missing. I also think it's for the suppression oh, of consciousness. Absolutely. Because they have to work really, really, really hard to keep people down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing is, is when you look at the increase in distraction, so to speak, and all yeah. the stuff going on in the media and pitting wars against each other and picking every possible socioeconomic, yeah. race, gender, everything to, to war people, right. why that's increasing not only shows us that, hey, are, we're a little bit like cuckoo here, but at the same <laughs> time, it's, it's, it's increasing because it's like, it's so easy for us to awaken now. All we have to do is step back and say, mm. let me just get rid of all this crap and then we will naturally evolve. But we have to, we have to be sure to push out the crap as it comes in, right? right? And the challenge that I guess we have is, is 
you know, we keep getting pushed back into the crap and just keep ex accepting it, accepting it, accepting it, and choosing to do it and choosing to do it. And it goes back to what you said earlier. Yeah. Ask yourself the questions, what should I be moving on from? Right. What should I mm. be, who am I really working for? What am I really supporting, right? right. And at the root, you know, you yeah. ask yourself, what's at the root of this? And, mm -hmm. and I think that um, sometimes it's easy to say, well, you know, they're just paying me or, um, well, I'm not sure. But when you look at that root, that root is still connected to what it is that you're doing. Absolutely. You know? So you gotta go to the roots and, and understand. And, and I think that's what I've tried to do in this arena is I've tried to go to the roots and, and really you know, dig deep and, and say, okay, what's at, the, what's at the core of this thing? Yeah. Why hasn't this come out? And what needs to be done? And, and, and how do we do it? Mm -hmm. So I saw a note on, on one of your papers there, and it's up to you if we want to go into this, but um, what is it? you had mentioned uh, Elon Musk being the Edison of today. And, um, and I don't know if this is Gene's notes or if this is your uh, stuff based on, oh, on the hidden energy that. stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, okay. and I thought maybe you could comment it, if you want, right, where it's, it's one of those things, and, and this is the reason why I wanted to ask, is because when people think of new energy today, mm. they think of one man. Yeah. They think of Elon Musk and they think of Tesla and they think about how he is bringing forth the highest technology available. And it's really not. We, we know if you're oh, in this right, space, we know right. it's very primitive stuff. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, what, what's going on there with that? And, and why, why do you feel, uh, if, that is, if those are Gene's words, why do you feel she chose to, to look at Elon Musk in that manner? Well, we talked about including him in there because um, the, the book <clears throat> um, is called Hidden Energy and it's about a paradigm shift in con consciousness and yep. you know we felt that we were going beyond tesla tesla mm -hmm. um tesla actually as the man we yep. felt like it was you know we, there's a lot of people that talk about tesla we wanted to go beyond yes. because there's inventors today that are we have many teslas oh, it's, yeah. it's not just one we have many that are on the planet right now um and that's why we there's there's you know part of the book is about going beyond Tesla, but we understood that Tesla, I mean, if I ask even, you know, people in my family <laughs> about Tesla, they don't think of Nikola Tesla, they think of, you know, Tesla the car, and, yeah. and I have a family member that has a Tesla, <laughs> and it's a cool car, it's like, hey, this is better than my car, and it, you know, runs well, and, it, and it's nice, and it's sleek, and it does all these cool things, but, you know, th that is that, that recognition, so we felt it was appropriate to to talk about him in, in you know this chapter um, and to to, a, to have people ask some fundamental and critical questions because people that are going to pick up the hidden, hidden energy book um, you know some people are going to be new to this arena and they're going to think about Elon Musk as being Tesla mm -hmm. you know the, the the name recognition so we wanted to kind of break some of those walls down a bit and and you know, have some discussions about you know some of the things that he is doing and what the relationship could be and maybe what it's not, uh, and to make that a little bit more abundant and clear. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that, uh, in a sense, that because we, we talked about how bringing forth some of these technologies is difficult in today's yeah. level of consciousness yes, and infrastructure? Is. Yes, it is. Do you think Elon has a sense of what he would absolutely love to bring out but can't due to that infrastructure, or do you think he's very sort of happy just doing what he's doing? I've never met him. I know people that know him um, on levels of. Um, you know, I wouldn't say personal, but, but that know him and that work with him. And there's what I've been told, but again, this is secondhand information, uh, but it kind of rings true to me um, that it, I don't know if he has that level of consciousness in order to really um, potentially bring out some of these technologies. Uh, and from what I can understand, it seems like he's having a hard time doing what he's doing right now in general. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if we can, and I think this also goes to the, the Western mind. We think like there's one person that is supposed to do mm -hmm. this. And I think that we're being asked to, again, show up really differently, that it's not about one person and not that he even operates as one person. He has a whole organization. But, you know, who surrounds that person and wh what is that really? And, you know, m I'll just continue to say my, my sense is we've got to get away from the one person that we think is the next, yeah. uh, whatever, Edison or even Tesla um, or even, you know, Buckminster Fuller or the next, <laughs> you know, Einstein, you know, the list, next Jesus, like the, ne the list goes on and on and on. And 
it, it does seem like we're being asked to step away from that and to look at something, you know, I would say, I would say bigger. So I would be speculating on, on, you know, Elon Musk if I said I absolutely knew what this guy was doing and how yeah. he was doing it. I do know um, that it does seem that, um, that he's looked at as the, the shining star of possibility yeah. from um, people that I would say that are newer in this arena, but maybe haven't been around so long. Because I do know of stories that um, there, there were devices, this is firsthand, that, that he's been exposed to and is not entirely sure what to do with them at this yeah. point. So, and you know, that's not, um, that's not a bad thing. That's mm -hmm. just an isness. Yeah. Well said. Um, so th the future of, and when I say future, it's very difficult to know 10 years, 20 years, but yeah. the next couple of years, yeah. right? Um, what does new energy space look like and what do you feel is the, the, the goals of, of the next little bit here? Yeah. Um, well, the, the organization is the organization that I'm working with. We're going through a transition and we will likely come out with something very, very new. Um, mm -hmm. And that's in the works. So the, the, what it was and what it needs to be and what it is, is, is different. And that I'll say, and I'll, I'll wait <laughs> to explain more um, until we've got all of our stuff, you know, finished. And, and you know, we know, um, we know clearly, you know, the exact direction that, that we're taking this organization. And so that's a good thing. Um, but what do I think that space looks like? Well, here's what I've seen, I've seen Inventors, investors, scientists, um, academics, um, people like me, you, you know, people like us that are watching. I've seen a, a shift in a change where I call it the hero mentality is leaving that one person has to do this and it's one idea and you know it's like you know two people are leading the charge to you know for this this one thing i've seen that begin to fall by the wayside because it doesn't work yeah. um the the when i call the megalomaniac i think they serve their time whomever the they's are you know they serve their time they they created noise and they they busted down, you know, some of the, the the doors that probably wouldn't have been busted down by someone like myself or, or anybody else, right? Um, but they did that, and and now that is not necessarily what's needed to run an organization. Uh, that's not necessarily what's needed to be truly collaborative. Um, but they they did their job and they did it well. And what it did is it now opened up a space for other people to come in and. Um, what I refer to as uh, team two. It's like the quiet behind the scenes people that are not gonna be busting down the doors. Um, they wanna collaborate, they wanna mm -hmm. exchange, they want fair, they want balanced, they don't, I mean, even though they're willing to work an enormous amount of, of time and hours and energy, they need to maintain a core in their life. They need to maintain a connection with nature. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to have a, harmonic, uh, a harmonious relationship with their family. And that is not compromisable. It's almost like they need to do this work well and right that is in alignment with them as a whole being. And so I'm seeing more of that come into play. Um, and as a result, right money is showing up. As a result, right legal. Um, uh, it, it, the right legal mindset is extremely important because we still need all these things. Um, right manufacturing, right distribution, right media. Um, so I'm seeing more of the writer elements of the whole human being showing up um, that creates a greater capacity for collaboration. I mean, think about it for a moment. If, if people are truly collaborating and it's not like a nice to have, it's a genuine collaboration, then things move faster. And yeah. we know that there's a rapid shift occurring on the planet. I mean, we, we know it, right? Mm -hmm. Again, you could look at ourselves, like, where were you last year? Where are you this year? <laughs> How have your thoughts changed? Yeah. And, you know, what does your life look like? And, um, you know, because of that, if we actually do legit need each other, skills and abilities to make this thing roll and go. Yeah. And if one is operating out of ego or money um, or an attachment to a device and, you know, what they're going to get out of it, they're not part of like they're not invited on the field to, mm -hmm. to play the game 
at this point. It's kind of like they're sitting on the bench because, it, I mean, not only are they not fun to play with, but it, it may be hurting, you know, the, the, the work as a whole. So where I think this thing is headed in the next couple of years is a greater sense of, of organization in a non-heroic, non-showy, flashy way. You know, that one device is not going to save the entire world um, in a, a greater rise in collaboration and a greater rise in, in consciousness to show up as, as a whole being. Mm -hmm. and, and for that to actually be appreciated and, and nourished as opposed to, okay, well, um, you know, yeah, sorry, you have a family member that's sick, so I still need this information. Yeah. No, you know, I mean, it, we're being asked to show up and, and yeah. complete a lot of maybe the things that we didn't complete in previous lifetimes or, or what have you. So, um, in, in that wholeness, my God, the information that is exchanged and the detail and the the, the sheer originality of it. Um, I'll give you one example. There is someone that I know that is highly sought after for his uh, technical expertise in something. I won't say even what it is because it may give it away. He's such a good person and he's a person that has held on deeply to his moral and ethics and he has given a lot to the world that he felt that he could give to. And he keeps being continually plucked for information because he's got something very unique and specific that many, many don't have that many want. But he's held on to his morals and his ethics and his integrity. And he knew that he couldn't release this information to people that were not able to honor it. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you know, he's releasing it to those that actually are able to um, get it because they're in that heart space and they're in that mind space to do the right thing with it. And when you get taught what that type of information is, you see, you actually truly see the beauty of the divinity in it. And, um, you know, to me, that's where we're headed. And so it pays to be, <laughs> it pays, it really pays off to evolve from the inside out because what lay, what lays beyond that, and it's hard to see it at the time, right? It's really difficult to see when you make these decisions to move away from things that have been feeding you a certain way and you know maybe create part of your personality and part of your identity. But when you actually have the courage to move away from those things and move into whatever that whisper of your soul is and you know what you hear spirit, when you actually have that like that true faith and courage to do that, you will be so positively surprised at who shows up and that level of trust. And it, it also feels like a family. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, um, you know, I've talked about like the cosmic family, but, you know, sometimes I think well, we find those people here on earth and they're embodied in, in different ways. And boy, it's, uh, it's a very, very sweet, sweet energy. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that interview. We covered a lot of different stuff. Um, we went through some of the, again, some of the demystifying it a little bit. You know, is this real? How many technologies have you personally sort of seen or been able to say this is legit? And the reason why we went that route was because, you know, there's likely a lot of different technologies out there, right? But how many of them are truly working? How many of them are truly scalable? How many of them are utilizing stuff that is truly, you know, above and beyond uh, some of the very sort of primitive type things like solar and wind and stuff like that, that, you know, we're still talking about, we're still seeing come out, but really this isn't the cutting edge of energy. When we talk about things like Tesla and the, you know, uh, you know, the, the solar uh, shingles and these sorts of things that you know, we think, wow, this is like the cutting edge of technology. It's not. And we need to get out of that, that framework because when we start to think that that's the cutting edge, we start to actually realize we're placing a massive limit on what's actually out there and what's actually available. What we need to be focusing on, and again, this is part of the reason why we did this interview and asked some of the questions that we talked about was, you know, our hunch and, you know, what we kind of went through a lot in being involved in these energy technologies over the past couple of years is we saw that one of the biggest barriers, and again, we talked about this in the interview, is the suppression of the consciousness, or it is in general humanity's current state of consciousness that is not allowing, in essence, these technologies to come out. Let me give you a very clean example of that. And 
it's essentially like let's say you know this this energy technology were to come forward and and you know it gets in the hands of a, of a power company and that power com company suddenly just you know starts charging the, the exact same amount of money for power but it's just cleaner you know this isn't necessarily a huge advancement forward so when we say the consciousness of the planet is not necessarily ready, it means we're still in an old world mindset where we still view through our lens of how we create this world and what we think is possible. We're still kind of saying, yeah, so we have these technologies and we'll just kind of fit it into the way our world works now. You know, still about full on capitalism and full on, you know, doing things that it's about making money for these people. But, you know, not really sure what's going to happen to these people over there. And it's the haves and the have nots and all this sort of stuff. And there's a lot of people who really defend capitalism deeply saying that, you know, this is just the best thing for the world and la da da da. That's a perspective. That's an opinion. And that's okay to have that. But do we really need deep down? Do we really need even a means for exchange? And I know this is like something that when I say this, people say, oh my God, of course, Joe, you, we gotta at least barter. We don't need to do anything, right? If you really break down these systems deeply and you check within yourself and really kind of ask yourself, what is possible here? And what, where does, you know, having money as an exchange, where does that leave us? How does that limit our potential? We live on a planet that's already fully abundant. Everything we need is already completely here. Why do we need to always have exchange to get the things that we want, to get the things that everybody needs? Even with bartering, think of how that system would very quickly fall apart in the sense that how do you value everybody's stuff? How does that happen? How does the person with a specific service that is completely unrelated to another person's specific service, what if they cannot make a trade? What happens, right? There's, there's very clear challenges that we get into every time we go back to this mentality of, I do this, therefore I need this in return which is a very old world way of thinking. And I know it kind of sounds like very far outside of what we're currently doing, but this is part of the shift that we're going through. Is, and this is why these technologies don't come out, is these technologies are available, they're there, and they're gonna slowly drip into our world, but they're going to happen as we are a lot more ready to stop looking at our world as individuals trying to take advantage and get and make our place in the world, but where we're able to look at ourselves as a oneness consciousness as in as, as not as we're not individuals anymore and we don't have our own individual lives and you know we're all brainwashed to think the same way it's not that it's recognizing the harmony that must exist between you know yourself your neighbor the person across the other end of the world the animal kingdom the planet the galaxy other beings all of this ties in together and it's a state of consciousness that connects everything together and only when we get a lot closer and we're starting to really embody that state of being which is where we come in as individuals how we can contribute to this is practice getting into that state deprogramming the old ways questioning what we're currently doing how we're currently viewing things expanding our minds and possibility of what actually is you know we're capable of doing and the more we do that the more we prepare our consciousness and develop a practice, right, as we practice these things in the world, that begins to allow for the, you know, introduction of these technologies in a way where it's not going to be corrupted by the old way of thinking and the old way of being. So yes, there's suppression from the, you know, the Illuminati, the deep state, however you want to call that, but there's also a suppression within the fact that our consciousness, and I wouldn't even call it a suppression at that point, I would call it more of like, we're simply not ready for these technologies because there's a greater change within ourselves and within our collective that must happen first. And that's a very, very, very important thing when it comes to these energy technologies that I think needs to be spread when we talk about it and when we look at the situation because it helps us to look at all the layers and it helps us to see where we get involved in the process as individuals creating this collective way of being that we're living under. So I hope you enjoyed this interview. There's one more from Susan coming up in the next few days. And if, you, if it's already out, go check it out now. And once again, if you haven't watched her first one about her contactee experience and the research she's done, be sure to check that one out because it's an awesome one. And it kind of helps to build sort of the foundation as to how she got to where she is now. Hope you enjoyed the interview and we'll see you in the next one.